you know, this uh, Lenten season, we've been in a series of messages on uh, what we're going to give up, what we're going to give up for Lent. And it struck me this week that, that uh, um, in every area of our life, there's we're not just uh, free for things. We're not just gathering up things in our life, but we're, we, we need to be released or releasing at the same time as we're taking hold of something new. And that's a, a picture in the Bible that shows up over and over again that, that we can't just carry all our junk and have God doing new things and bringing new things into our life. There's at some point you have to clear it out. Now, I tend to be a hoarder, uh, not just uh, with stuff, although boy, I've got a lot of stuff. I'm also a spiritual hoarder, which is a weird thing. You know, it's like I, as I, God wants to teach me new things, but I'm holding on to the old stuff, you know, and I got it stacked up like uh, old newspapers around the room. And um, actually, I probably have old newspapers around the room stacked up too, but um, God's always saying, tell me, just let go of some stuff so that I can give you something new, so I can show you the next steps. And I'm going, well, I'll take the next step, Lord, but just pile it up on top of the other things because I don't want to let go of anything. And so it makes for a very awkward uh, discipleship. And our passage today that I want us to look at is in uh, Colossians chapter 3. It's a familiar passage, probably I've uh, heard many times. Um, I want to start at uh, verse 9 of chapter 3 in Colossians. Do not lie to each other. Since you've taken off your old self with its practices, see that you let go of some things, you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Greek or Jew, there's no circumcised or uncircumcised, there's no barbarians, there's no Scythians, slaves or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. Some translations say put on. Uh, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these Things. Over all these things, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And then it says this in verse uh, 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish each other with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So Lord, teach us. Teach us from this passage in your word and teach us how we might be free to experience what you would have for us. And that's our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, you know, I come to this passage and I've, uh, I need to, to tell you something. I, I have actually over... The last way too many years that I've been a pastor, I think we've done almost a thousand weddings. And since the very first one I did, which was on a railroad track in Del Mar, California, not realizing that as we were there standing on the track waiting for a train came around the corner, saw us, hit its horn, and miraculously I jumped forward instead of back. <laughs> Otherwise, it would have been half a West Paul there. But um, that was my first wedding experience. And in that wedding, shortly after the train almost killed the wedding party and me, and the solo banjo player, who was the only musician. Um, okay, it was a long time ago. Okay, get over it. Uh, I, I read this passage as a prayer, as a blessing for the couple. <laughs> the... Um, as God's chosen people, holy and beloved, clothe yourself in compassion and kindness. And, and it meant so much to me as I read that, I thought, well, that's what I want in my marriage. That's what I want. And so for the last so many years, I have read that as a blessing in every wedding that I've done, like a thousand weddings. And, I, and yet I very rarely would ever preach on it. It was, I saw it only as something to bless uh, these couples. And, but I looked at it today and I thought, 
You know, if we're going to be moving forward as God wants us to move forward and live the way he wants us to live, we've got to, A, stop lying to ourselves and take off, you know, let go of the stuff that we've been carrying around and put on the new things. And like I said, clothe yourself and put on these things, compassion and kindness. And um, now, last week we talked about the kindness. Do you all remember the Greek word we used? Yeah, you do. Prestotes, right? That sounds more Spanish now when we say it. But um, the kindness as the smoothing out, and the, right? Fits you personally. Okay, that's in there. We put that on. We wear it like clothes. And uh, gentleness and patience and all those things. And we put on the new self. And then when that happens, it says that, that the stereotypes all go. They go away. We stop treating people in groups and clusters and uh, bunch them together so we don't have to do them. And we start dealing with people uh, with love and with care and with forgiveness because we're actually seeing real people and not just bunches of them. Here, there, there's no Greek or Jew or circumcised or uncircumcised or barbarian or Scythians or slaves or free, Christ and all, right? Now, I've got to tell you how upset I was about three doors down, some Scythians moved in, and I, you know, I, I got some problems with that, okay. Uh, but they think that I'm a barbarian, so they've got their own prejudices too. But it, it, the prejudices change, right? We have different, well, nobody here is really worried about the Scythians coming into your neighborhood, do you? Are you? Not, not that much. But we've got our own way of lumping people and going, well, sure, they're that way. We don't have to deal with them or we'll deal with them differently. But it says, there isn't any of that anymore. When, when, when Christ is in control and, and, and we're together as his people and we're growing together and we put off the old ways, then, then we start seeing people as the unique, unrepeatable miracle that God made them to be. And not just somebody that we lump together with others and dismiss. Now, clothe ourselves in these things and then it says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Now, I, I'm notoriously restless. You know, I admit that. Um, I, I wrote a book once called the, um, If God's Smiling on Me, Why Isn't It Enough? And the publisher hated the title because they said, um, well, if God's smiling on you, it is enough. <laughs> and I went, well, not for me. <laughs> and, and, well, nobody will ever buy that book then. You know? And so they changed the title and wrecked it. But, uh, but I, I've always felt like there's this restlessness inside that, that we need to um, let go of in order to let the peace of God rule in our hearts. But that's been a struggle for me. And uh, anybody else ever, ever find it difficult to experience the, the peace of God ruling in your, in your hearts? Is that ever or just me and Baron, I guess. Okay, that's a good. Or you may just be stretching. That's okay, too. You know? uh, and I think I figured out exactly what the problem has been. And, and see if I'm wrong here. The reason that it's so difficult to let the peace of God rule in our lives and in our hearts comes down to one thing. That band, the eagles. They are to blame for this, right? Now, you young people don't know about the Eagles, but Tuesday, our, our small group was meeting over at the Starbucks on 185th, and in walked the bass player for the Eagles, Timothy. I went, whoa, whoa! I went to get a refill so I could stand behind him. <laughs> <laughs> he never even said hi. <laughs> I tried to hum some songs, you know, Desperado, you know. <laughs> anyway. But I think that the eagles are the reason that so many of us have trouble letting the peace of God rule in our lives. And here's the reason why. There was this guy, Jack Timpson, who I went to high school with, who wrote this song that eagles picked up and sang. Peaceful, easy feeling. Right? right you young people don't know that, but it's peaceful. I got a peaceful, easy feeling, you know. Uh, I know you won't let me down because I'm already standing on the ground. Those dumb lyrics, but uh, <laughs> well, we believe that. And so we wanted this peaceful, easy feeling, and nobody's going to let us down, and we're going to just kind of be there, and everything's going to be great. What a crock. It doesn't work that way. Why? 
Because God doesn't intend for us to be standing around with a peaceful, easy feeling. That wasn't what life was meant to be. What it says here is, let the peace of God, what? Hang out with you in a mellow way? No. Let the peace of God influence you subtly? No. Let the peace of God, what? Rule in your lives. It's an authority. It's a, it's a power. It's, it's a, almost a, a dominance that, that God's peace is going to take over our life with such authority that, that we would actually become subject to it. That's aggressive. That's not the eagles, you know, day to day to day thing, you know. And so we got to get over that. Let go, let go of the eagles, folks. <laughs> and, um, and let God's peace rule in our hearts. Now I want to look at that. Because um, when you look at that uh, word for peace that's used here and in, in the New Testament, it doesn't mean sitting around in a mellow garden somewhere, you know. I wish it did, but it doesn't. It, what it means is um, to take the things that are broken in our lives and reset them, sometimes forcefully, probably not painlessly. You were reset. It's like, it's like you break your arm, right? And, and so you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, you know, let me put on some soft music here while you think good thoughts, and that'll be with the healing that you need. In fact, you know, with your broken arm, if you have that peaceful, easy feeling, you'd just be fine. And you know, I really love my patients. I don't know jack about medicine, but I love my patients. So you just sit here and think good thoughts with that broken arm, right? It doesn't work. What do they do? I think it's cruel what they do. It doesn't make any sense. Sometimes they break it a second time. In a better spot, I guess. But it still breaks, right? And, and they reset it, and then they stick a cast on it. So you're walking around feeling like Frankenstein sometimes, and you do this big old cast, and it's broken sometimes a couple of times, and it has to reset, and it hurts, and it takes a long time to heal. How many of you broken bones? A few? Okay. Have you noticed that they heal in like a week? No. And they hurt right up until the exact moment that they're healed. We were in a car crash a few years ago in uh, Hilton Head, and it uh, wasn't my fault. A, actually, it was, literally, it was a pig farmer from North Carolina, drove his truck through in front of us, and man, it destroyed our car. And I got out okay, but Eileen had a broken sternum, and she couldn't uh, breathe. And so she spent our vacation in the hospital, which was fun, <laughs> you know. And uh, But the thing about it was that with a broken sternum, you can't move, turn, clear your throat, uh, speak loudly, and you sure don't want the person next to you in bed to cough or roll over. I found that out. Um, and, and she'd go to the doctors and they'd say, okay, this is going to heal, this is going to heal. And I'm going, when? When does this heal? Because you know, this pain goes on and on and on. And they go, well, you're going to go along and you're going to reach by, and when it heals, the pain will stop. But right up to the minute that it heals, it will hurt like crazy. And so it doesn't like get slowly better. If you go along, pain, 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 no pain today. And I thought they were nuts, but it actually was the way it worked. And, and I think what happens is to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts means that sometimes we're in pain much longer than we want to be while the healing is going on. And, and the, they reset us. This peace, is, it resets the brokenness in our life and makes it right. And then the healing can take place in a new way. But I want things to happen quickly. Um, you know, isn't there some kind of a pill you can take that'll mend a broken limb? Wouldn't that be good? Uh, take this pill and then you'll be okay. You know? But it isn't. And the thing I found in, in my life is that my broken stuff goes on for quite a while, as does yours, right? And 
It doesn't mean that God is not mending it. But we have to allow that peace, the mending, the resetting, the broken things, we have to allow that to actually dominate us, to be the rule of our life. And that we see the, the pains and the broken things that are being mended, and we see God's work in our life, and we see that actually as evidence of God's presence, not uh, reminders that he's forgotten about us and is caring for the important people. Now, Eugene Peterson is a great, great writer. Uh, wrote the message you know, that so many of us use. A long time ago, he had a book called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. This is what he says. The Christian life is not a quiet escape to a garden where we can walk and talk uninterrupted, uninterruptedly with our Lord. And it is not a fantasy trip to a heavenly city where we can compare our blue ribbons and gold medals with the others who've made it to the winner's circle. To suppose that or to expect that is to turn the nut the wrong way. The Christian life is going to God. That's what it is, it says. In going to God, Christians travel the same ground that everyone else walks on. They breathe the same air. They drink the same water. They shop in the same stores. They read the same newspapers. They're citizens under the same governments. They pay the same prices for groceries and gasoline. They fear the same dangers. They're subject to the same pressures. They get the same distresses, and they're buried in the same ground. The difference, get what, get what Eugene Peterson says here. The difference is, that each step we walk, each breath we breathe, we know we're preserved by God. We know we are accompanied by God. We know we are ruled by God. And therefore, no matter what doubts we endure or what accidents we experience, the Lord will preserve us from evil he said, and he will keep our life. Now that's different than what I thought when I first became a Christian years ago. I was taught that once you have Jesus in your life, everything is changed and everything, and you're not like the others. And so when I found my life pretty much like the others, I was kind of disappointed. And I thought, maybe I didn't get it right with accepting Christ into my life. And so I thought I better, so I, you know, I went to a church where we had altar calls. Come, and so I went forward like 50 times uh, Sunday nights trying to get it right because my life pretty much looked like everybody else's. I didn't realize that it will look like everybody else's, except that we are going to God. Every step we take, Every thought we have, every choice we make, every pain we endure, every miracle we see, we are going to God. And that is different. That is totally different. Now, as a family here, I think it's important for us to be able to encourage each other when we're going through the times of brokenness to look to see God's hand in it. And when we're tempted to want to escape and uh, you know, just kind of get that peaceful, easy feeling and whatever that takes, we need to come alongside each other and encourage each other, no, 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 no. It's about resetting the brokenness. It's not about escaping. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since we, as members of one body, were called to peace and be thankful. Whatever you do in word and deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks. It's time to take off the old. Time to let go of stuff. Time to stop hoarding, spiritually or otherwise. And it's time to put on Compassion, kindness, goodness, forgiveness, and love.
It's not passive. It's active. It's a choice we make. It's an action we do. And then we let God draw us to himself. So pray with me, please. Lord Jesus, we would go to you. We would. And give us the courage not to be diverted, not to be distracted. Give us the courage not to uh, give up. Give us the courage um, to see your hand at work, healing, caring, drawing, loving us so we can do it for each other. We ask for your spirit to be unleashed in us and around us. And we ask for the courage to be your people the way you've called us to be. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.